when I was in college in 1976 at Azusa Pacific University, I was in a dorm, uh, and you know, on the weekend, a lot of the students uh, would go home uh, that lived in the LA area, and so the dorm was kind of a ghost town a bit, and there was just a few guys in, in the dorm on the weekends, so we had lots of fun. Uh, one, one weekend, uh, uh, a, a guy called me down to his room to kind of hang out, so I, was, I went down there, and I think it's about the time headphones were invented. Uh, I had never used a pair of headphones before. He had a pair of headphones. They were supposed to be cutting edge, uh, and that was back when you used records, you know, the, you know, took up half your dorm, the stereo player and everything. Uh, and he goes, hey, man, you got to come in. I got a great rock group you got to listen to. And I'm like, cool, yeah. He goes, I got headphones, man. They're just awesome. And so I put the headphones on. He stuck this record on, on the turntable and needle dropped. And it was uh, Toys in the Attic was Aerosmith. And I, you know who, Aerosmith? Yeah. You know, I was just like, oh, this is just amazing. <laughs> Amazing sound. Yeah, uh, nice group of young men, what you say? <laughs> yeah, the, uh, you know, I suppose your daughter said, I want to marry one of those guys, you know. Uh, yeah, they've got their own issues, do they not? Uh, I started listening to them back in the, the 70s uh, when I was in college, and, I, and I've listened to them since, and uh, it, it's really interesting when you listen to a rock group uh, and listen to what they have to say about life, because it's so misguided, uh, and you have to somewhat stay in touch with your culture so you can reach your culture uh, and so I've listened to some of their music. Uh, Steven Tyler, uh, he, he's, um, wow, he has some issues. Uh, he, he, <laughs> there's one of their songs I found most interesting. Uh, uh, 1993, they came out with a song uh, called Living on the Edge. Uh, Living on the Edge uh, is basically their brand of, hey, our world is messed up. How, what's the matter with it? And, and that's who you want telling you as a hard-driving rock group, what's wrong with the world today? Uh, here's what they said, quote, there's something wrong with the world today. Would you agree? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I'm with you, Stephen. I don't know what it is. Nah, you just love me. Uh, I think I know what it is. But he says, I don't know what it is. Then he makes a summation. Something's wrong with our eyes. You know the song I'm talking about? Okay, something's wrong with our eyes. Um, nah, I don't think it's the eyes. And then he goes on to say, we're seeing things in a different way, and God knows it ain't his. It sure ain't no surprise. We're living on the edge. And we're living on the edge, all right. What's the problem? He says it's your eyes. I don't think it's eyesight. Now, I will, I will give it to him. If you go to, um, I think it's 2 Corinthians um, 4, 4. Um, let me turn there. We'll get to Romans in a minute. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the glorious gospel uh, who is the image of God. Christ, who's the image of God. Uh, so, yeah, there's a mind problem. Yeah, they could say there's an eyesight problem, Steve, but it's more than that. It's a heart problem. Jeremiah talks about the heart problem of mankind. Uh, it's, it's, it's the main essence of who you are is your heart. Uh, Jeremiah uh, prophesying to his nation prior to the uh, Babylonian invasion that came in three waves starting in 606 BC uh, says this in chapter 17 to his uh, people. Uh, we'll give you the King James Version and then the New American Standard Translation because there's a little uh, different nuance as I'll show you. Um, he says the heart is deceitful above all things and the things is uh, italicized in the Hebrew text because it's not in the text. Uh, so he really says that the heart is deceitful above all uh, and desperately wicked. And then he asks a rhetorical question. The heart is so evil, who can even know it? Isn't that the truth? Just when you, you thought you heard the next level of decadence and evil, there's another one beyond that one. Yeah, the New American Standard reads a little differently. It says the heart is uh, more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Uh, if you read this in the Hebrew text, you would immediately know that the, the very first two words are not the heart. Uh, that's put into English to make it uh, easy to read. The very first word in Hebrew is deceit. Uh, and the fact that that word is placed first in the sentence makes it highly emphatic in Hebrew. So anybody that read it in Hebrew would know what his main point there is. D deceit that originates in the heart's the problem. See, man has a core problem. It's the heart, and it's all about deceit and deception. Uh, he says it, it's desperately sick, which the New American Standard is a better translation to the Hebrew word. Uh, it, that word doesn't necessarily primarily denote wickedness. It denotes terminal illness. And that's what he says is, is, is like men. He's like terminally ill, and it starts with his heart. He's got a heart issue. Stephen Tyler uh, was kind of close, but not what the scriptures say. The scripture says man has a, a problem with his heart, and because he has a problem with his heart, he needs someone uh, who can fix his heart. That's only going to be God. That's going to be Christ. See, Paul understands this as a Jewish rabbi. He studied Jeremiah. He studied the Old Testament. He understands man has a heart problem. 
So that's why when he writes the book of Romans, he tells this church, if I come to your church and teach there, I'm going to talk uh, to you in verses uh, 16 and 17 of chapter one by way of review. He said, I'm gonna talk about the gospel because the gospel is that which gives man who's sick health. And it's the only thing that can give it to him. It's the gospel of God. And he's going to explain why man is sick. And he's going to describe Gentiles' sin in chapter 1, then Jewish sin in chapter 2. And he's going to say, uh, you both have a sin issue. You both need salvation. Now, this was news to the Jewish people that he would be writing to because by way of review, uh, they thought they were sin based on several criteria. Number one, they're Jews. So they believe just because we're Jews, we're, we're believers, we're, we're saved. Paul says in chapter two, uh, chapter three, well, it really started in chapter two, but in uh, three, one to eight, you're not going to heaven just because of heredity. Then they would say, well, we have, we have a copy of the Torah scrolls in our house. We're saved because of that. No. We're, uh, we're, uh, we've been circumcised. No. Uh, we're saved because we, have, we observe uh, Passover uh, and we observe Rosh Hashanah, etc. No. No. Paul says none of those outward works save you. You have to have an inner faith relationship with the Christ, the Messiah, the Messiah. And so he's going to tell the Jews that are absolutely shocked at what he's trying to say is, um, the only leg up that you have on a Gentile is the fact that God chose you of all the people of the planet to reveal himself to, you know? And he did in a big way. Because he told them at Mount Sinai that, uh, how sinners can approach him, blood sacrifice, Leviticus 1 to 7. Uh, where to approach him, the tabernacle. Uh, like uh, Exodus 24 through the end of the book. Uh, you you got to come to the tabernacle. There's only one door into the tabernacle. You must bring a sacrifice to cover sin, etc. Explicit way to approach God. Uh, Paul says that that's the only leg up you have in a Gentile is God revealed himself to you of all peoples of the planet how sinners who have a heart problem can approach him. Paul wants to further his conversation to uh, his Jewish brethren by enlightening uh, them of their spiritual situation, which I'm sure was news to them because years ago it had been news to him because he thought he was saved based upon his works. Belief in God coupled with works. And he's, he's going to tell them uh, that the gospel is about the work of Christ. That's the only work that counts. And so he's going to be articulating uh, an answer to a question uh, in this chapter, which I would articulate the question this way. Why do all people, Jews and Gentiles, need a savior? I mean, why? That's what he's going to be talking about in a major way in chapter uh, 3, verses 9 to 20. And we're going to switch metaphors. You're not supposed to do this um, when you speak, switch metaphors or mix metaphors. We're switching metaphors today because we just talked about uh, man has, has a heart issue. We're going to switch metaphors into a courtroom. And I think the transition is nice because if man has a heart issue, Paul's going to come over into a courtroom setting in chapter 3, 9 to 20 and say, let me give you uh, the evidence as an attorney as, as to why you're guilty in God's courtroom. But, and that's the bad news. But he's not going to stop there. In verse 21 and following, he's going to say, let me give you the good news of how someone who is sick over here in their heart gets a new heart. And that's going to come by means of Christ. But that's in verse 21. We'll get there around Christmas time, I'm assuming. You with me? So we want to look at the courtroom setting. Paul's going to validate the fact that Jews and Gentiles are both guilty before God uh, of sin and they both need a savior. Verse 9 is his charge. Uh, the charge is, what, two rhetorical questions. What then? What's the conclusion of what I just said to you Jewish people in verses 1 to 8? Well, you're not saved by works. You're not saved because you're a Jew. You're not saved by, etc. What then? Well, the answer is, we're sinners. Uh, are we better than they? Are we Jews better than the Gentile? What would they say? Yeah. Yeah, we're better than the Goyim. Paul says, no, you're not. He says, no, not at all. Uh, for we have already charged that, that's the legal term, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. And Greeks was, there were so many Greeks at the time, that's just another code word for Gentile. So let's break down his uh, courtroom setting. He asked two questions. What then, and are we better than they? And the answers to the conclusion is, uh, what's the conclusion? We're all sinners. Are we better than they? No, Paul. We're sinners just like everyone else. What's his verdict? Uh, well, he tells you his verdict uh, in the last part of verse 9. Uh, with the uh, connective for. See the word for? Do we even have that verse to, to show them? I don't know if I put that on there. See, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For? Uh, in Greek, it's the word gar. Gar denotes a conjunction that's going to represent the reason, reason grammatically, why the Jew is no better than the Gentile. Why? What do you, why does he say the reason why they're no better than a Gentile? Uh, they're both under what? Sin. Sin. They can't escape it. They can't escape sin. Uh, the word uh, under sin is a preposition. I know it's early. It's grammar. Don't you love grammar? You love grammar? 
Okay, you pray about it. I'll pray for you. Uh, this is the Greek, <laughs> this is the, the Greek word preposition, hupo. It means to be under something. So how many are in the military? Just raise your hand. Okay. Right. Anybody over here? Excellent, thank you. Is somebody over you? Okay, so if you're a private, who's over you? Everybody. Everybody. <laughs> yeah. If you're a general, who's over you? Well, it depends on what kind of general you are. Or admiral, whatever. Because I've learned since I came here, I just thought there were generals. I've learned differently. Okay, there's like a one star, then there's a two star, and then there's a three star. So there's, there's generals over generals. Who's over the generals? Isn't there a sec def in there somewhere? I'm just saying. You know, there's a stratification. And then there's the president, POTUS, right? He's over all. And then God. Hupo means to be under the command of somebody else. So when Paul says, we are all under hupo sin, it's a military term. Everybody got it. It means somebody's over you. Dominion. They own you. Do they not? The military. You're under the authority of uh, the commanding officers, etc. cetera. Uh, and, and so he says, we are all uh, charging the fact that all are under the, the dominion and power of the commander called sin. Sin. You can't escape the fact that you're under sin. I've told you this before. Review's a wonderful thing. I'll tell it to you again. Repetition's wonderful, isn't it? If you do not believe in sin, have a child. <laughs> My theology is pretty simple. Because whoever sits down with the child and goes, today, honey, we're having a lesson on lying. They just, they just know this stuff, don't they? We're going to come out, well, honey, it's just a lesson on defiance. You don't have to have those lessons. Why? Hoopo. They're under the dominion of sin. What's your job? To help them not be under the dominion of sin. Do you know what I'm saying? They, they come into the packaging that way. And so uh, Paul says, yeah, I understand, Hupo. We're all under sin, uh, and you can't get away from it. And he's going to say, uh, all Jews and Gentiles are under sin. Now, you have to ask the question, uh, is the universality of sin taught in the Old Testament? Answer, yes. It's everywhere. The Jews should have paid attention. Psalm 143, verse 2 says this. And do not enter into judgment with thy servant, God, uh, for in thy sight no man living is righteous. And we know there's not a 100% righteous person. Ecclesiastes, Solomon writes in chapter 7, verse 20, Indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. Notice the word continually. Why? You can't do it. Give it a good shot the rest of the day. Uh, my daughter uh, and son-in-law and the grandkids uh, flew home Tuesday, Monday. I'm planning, you know, to take them to the airport. I'm thinking IED. I'm thinking Reagan. They're thinking Baltimore. <laughs> I'm thinking you got to be kidding me, huh? That's like a foreign country, you know? Yeah. Oh, well, it's only you know like whatever, 37 miles away. That's like eight hours in a car here. <laughs> They're like, hey, we got to fly straight to Sacramento with kids. It's easier, you know? Like you may never see us again. We may never get home. Um, if you don't believe in sin, just drive to Baltimore and then try coming back <laughs> and see how your faith does on the freeway. You know, I'm flying along, you know, whatever it is, the speed limit, 75, whatever it is, you know, uh, you know, and all of a sudden there's a guy in a truck and like, you know, this, not the slow lane, but the next lane over. I mean, he's doing, I clocked him. He's doing 35 miles an hour. I just want to get out and have a loving conversation with him, you know. <laughs> I, like, I can drive in my car. I can't even drive my car, sunroof open, stereos on, and he's going 35. Do you think I pulled up behind him going, praise God for you, hallelujah? Uh, no. Anyway, moving on. It's too convicting, too convicting. It's hard to be continually righteous, right? Why? You're going to blow it. Why? Because you got clay feet. Uh, Proverbs 20. Uh, who can say, I have cleansed my heart, I am pure from sin. If your high school student told you this tonight at dinner, why are you laughing? Because you're a parent, aren't you? Yeah, son. I think by 10, you're going to probably blow it. <laughs> yeah, you know, they can't do that. No, because we come into the world sinful, right? University of Alley of Sin taught in the Old Testament. How about the New Testament? Luke 6, Jesus speaking. For there is no good tree which produces bad fruit, nor on the other hand, a bad tree which produces good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. No kidding. Jesus loved gardening. That's why I love it. You should be in the yard today. It's a theological experience, isn't it? You're not going outside today? It's in the Bible. What did Jesus say? I've been analyzing trees. If you got a tree and it's a bad tree, what kind of fruit is it going to produce? 
bad fruit. If it's a good tree, it's going to produce fruit. What kind of fruit is it going to produce? Good fruit. What's the problem? The fruit of the tree. The tree. Now, I have to stop for just a minute. <laughs> my grandmother, God love her, my grandma Allery, I-S-L-A-R-E was her name. Married to my grandpa, uh, Dorsey. But I think he, he died when he was uh, 52 years old from brain cancer. I think I was 12. And so after the funeral, my grandma came over to me at my mom's house. I, was, I, think, I, was, I think I was 12. She put her arm around me and uh, she, said, uh, she said, Marty, you're now going to become my little man. And indeed I did. Uh, so I, I, my, my grandpa was a very mechanical. He was, uh, he was a descendant, you know, Choctaw Indian and the whole side of the family. Because um, his mother was Choctaw. Her, her mother and father were both Choctaws. My grandpa, you know, died. It was tragic. My grandma wanted me to be there for her. So you better believe I was. So I went to college. I can't even tell you how many times I mowed her yard, painted her picket fence, etc. But I, I did a lot of analyzing as I did this. Because gardening teaches you about God, does it not? I'm just saying, you're not a believer yet, but I am. And <laughs> she had a beautiful orange tree in her backyard. It was magnificent. And at the right time of year when all the fruit was ripe, I mean, they were huge oranges hanging on this tree. I learned as a young man, you do not eat that fruit. It was the worst orange God ever made. It was terrible. I mean, you, you peeled off the skin and sunk your teeth into it, and it was so sour, you couldn't even talk. It was unbelievable. So I, I learned to leave that alone. But the interesting thing is that there was like a three and a half foot white picket fence around the backyard. This tree hung over the fence and the high school was right down the street from my grandma's house. So I'd be working in the yard as a little 12 year old kid. Here comes all the big high school students and the trees laden with fruit. What do you think they're going to do? Hey man, that's my tree, you know. They're all stealing the fruit. I was cracking up the entire time. I know, bad tree, bad fruit. None of them made it like down to the first mulberry tree which was maybe 20 feet without going, wow, this is unbelievable. What's the problem with mankind? Well, he, he's got a, he's a bad tree. He's a bad tree. He produces bad fruit. Just comes with the packaging. Uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. Uh, notice how Jesus speaks to non-believing religious people. Was Jesus loving, kind, merciful, tenderhearted? Except, was he? Absolutely he was. Was he direct to people? Oh, yeah. Notice what he calls them. You brood of vipers. Brutus Vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man out of the good treasure brings forth that which is good. And the evil man out of his evil treasure brings forth what is evil. When the mouth opens, all the garbage coming out of there merely tells me what's in here. Your heart is the problem. Universality of sin. Intrinsically evil. We're born that way. Which points to the fact that we need somebody greater than us who's not intrinsically evil, who is perfect, to pay the penalty for sin and deliver us, that would be Jesus. But that's verse 21, we'll get there. You know, how do non-believers uh, deal with the fact that sin exists? It's most interesting uh, what they do. Uh, sometimes they try to get rid of it altogether. Uh, I was, uh, when I was finishing up my doctorate in apologetics uh, a month ago, I had to take two classes on cults. Uh, and one of the classes that I took uh, was on Christian science. And so I had to read all you know, the Christian science writing. So that's exhilarating reading right there. Uh, Mary Baker Eddy pouring through this stuff, reading this going, how did she get anybody to believe this stuff? Uh, you know, here's what she says about sin. Uh, because sin bothered her. So what, is it, what does she do with sin? I'll read from her own pen. Uh, this is from a, a book that is called The First Church of Christ, Scientists and Miscellany, Chapters, uh, 17, entitled, Answers to Criticisms. Here's what she says. I submit that Christian science has been made widely known into the world, that it contains the entire truth of the scriptures. That's a lie. Uh, I threw that in. She didn't put that in there. Uh, as also whatever portions of truth may be found in its creeds. This is most interesting. Notice what she says. Uh, in addition to this, Christian science presents the demonstrable divine principle and rules of the Bible this is interesting. Hitherto undiscovered in the translations of the Bible and lacking in the creeds. Oh. So you don't know anything spiritually unless you come to me. Esoteric knowledge. That's how you know it's a cult. Anyway, back to her quote. Therefore, I query, quote, Do Christians who believe in sin, and especially those who claim to pardon sin, believe that God is good and that God is all? All Christian scientists firmly subscribe to this statement. Yea, they understand it and the law governing it, namely the, the God, the divine principle of Christian science, is of purer eyes than to behold evil. Then she makes this conclusion. On this basis, they endeavor to cast out the belief in sin. Did you, did you hear me? I'm reading this going, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute, huh? 
She doesn't like sin, doesn't believe it exists. It's the only concept of the mind. So if I don't think about it, it doesn't exist. Oh, that's a good one. That's, that's the religion. And then she goes on to articulate, you've got to throw out the notion of sickness too. Really. It's very interesting if you study her life as she approached death. She was happy to use medicines to try to prolong her life. Because now all of a sudden she believes that disease is real. But anyway, enough of that. Uh, she just tried to get rid of sin altogether. Hey, sin doesn't exist. What did Paul say? All men are what? Under sin. Now, under the dominion of sin. Now, we would call that in theological circles total depravity. Total depravity. Well, what's that mean? Well, uh, Henry Thiessen uh, wrote uh, his uh, doctoral dissertation at Dallas Seminary uh, long before I went there. Uh, and they eventually put it into a book form you can read. It's called Lectures on Systematic Theology. Um, and I read it when I was in grad school. But here's what he says about the doctrine of total depravity. Quote, from the negative standpoint, it does not mean that every sinner is devoid of all uh, qualities pleasing to men. That he commits or is prone to every form of sin or that he is as bitterly opposed to God as it might be possible for him to be. So depravity doesn't mean people that don't know God can't do good things. Then he goes on to say, from a positive standpoint, it does mean that every sinner is totally destitute of the love of God, which is the fundamental requirement of the law. Uh, that he is supremely given to a pre preference of himself to God. That he has an aversion to God, which on occasion becomes active enmity to him. That his every faculty is disordered and corrupted. That he has no thought, feeling, or deed of which God can fully approve, because it's tainted by sin. That he has entered up on a line of constant progress in his depravity, from which he can no wise turn away from on his own strength. Left alone, man chooses sin and only gets worse. Then he says this, depravity has infected the whole man, his mind, his emotions, and his will. He's depraved. And give him half a chance and he'll show you his depravity. Doesn't mean he can't do moral good things and do uh, philanthropic things. But as, at his core, he has an issue. Uh, I was uh, trimming a tree one time. Uh, and I, you know, I, didn't ha I didn't have access to a uh, uh, chainsaw. But I had a tree saw, a hooked tree saw, a big one. And so I just told, you know, uh, the person in question, I'm just going to take that out, you know, with the tree saw. And so I positioned myself and, and got down at an angle to really use my back to cut this huge branch. And I began to cut through it, and it went completely through the branch and 19 perforations into my leg. That was painful. Have you ever had pain so great you could not speak? It was kind of like that. It was, so, it was my whole weight on that. It went clean through the branch. And the branch had leaves and everything. But at its core... It was totally rotted. I didn't know that. How does that apply to what we're talking about today? That's a one-to-one -one correspondence. See, that's like the person. They outside are a bunch of, you know, leaves looking beautiful, but at their core, ah, depraved, sinful, sinful. Paul minces no words because so much is at stake. He says, all men are under what? Sin, sin. Uh, he had four major options from words of sin in Greek to choose from. The word that he chooses here of the four major Greek words for sin is hamartia. Hamartia is a military term. It's a, it's a shooting term, like for archery. So if you shoot an arrow at a target, you're supposed to hit the target. If you miss said target altogether, that's called, in military terms, on a firing line, hamartia. You miss the target. When I was a youth pastor in San Diego, uh, years ago, I took my group to a, a church camp uh, in Alpine, uh, California, <laughs> and uh, you ever take church kids, city kids, and help them do archery who've never done it, and give them arrows and bows, and uh, it was interesting, and we had a huge firing line with the youth group on my command, they were all going to shoot at the targets, huge haystacks, massive targets, and they're shooting, and uh, no one's hitting anything, <laughs> scary, arrows flying everywhere, and all of a sudden, some guy in a bicycle rides behind the haystacks, <laughs> I mean, arrows are going by the guy. He, long blown hair. He's cool, man. He didn't even know death was near him, you know? But those kids couldn't hit the targets. See, that's a, it, I'm sitting there. This is a spiritual thing. The target is the holiness of God. We as sinners born with the rottenness of the soul can't hit his target no matter how hard we work toward it because we're incapable of doing that. That's hamartia. Paul says we're all under sin. We're all under sin. Everyone who has ever lived is under the dominion of sin and needs a savior. That leads logically to a second point. That's the charge. We're all under sin. The logical point is we're contaminated. He says, let me articulate the point that we are contaminated and show you that it's completely corrupt, our being. And we're not going to get far in this. And we're only going to get verse 10. 
He says, I'm gonna prove my point that man is, uh, uh, is, is, is under the bondage of sin and he's corrupt uh, because it is written. Now he says, as it is written. And you can't see it in the English text, but in the Greek text, this is gagropatai, which is a perfect tense, which is not used often. So when you see it, it's highly unusual. It, it means a past act with an abiding result. So, okay, so what does that mean? That means when he says this is written, what I'm gonna tell you about, He's going to quote, he's going to start quoting from the Old Testament to prove these points that man is contaminated. So his first quote is going to come from uh, Psalm 14, his very first point. But he says, as it is written, perfect tense, meaning everything God said about man's condition is a past act with an abiding result. And the only way he can get out of the state of sin and contamination was a faith relationship with the Messiah. That's going to be verse 21. As it is written. Notice what he says, man's character. He's going to cover three things. Number one, verses 10 to 12, man's character is corrupt. Uh, Numbers uh, 13 and 14, his conversation is corrupt. And then verses 15 to 17, his conduct is corrupt. You know, because you can't understand the light of the glorious gospel until you realize the blackness of your sin. That's what he's doing. What does he say first? Let's look at man's character. There is no one righteous, not even one. One. If you had to pick the great saints of the Old Testament, who would you pick? Daniel. Who else? That's it? Elijah. Elijah. You're so quiet. Abraham. I mean, how about, how about the guy who just, I love, I love Genesis 5. Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. Wouldn't you like to get into heaven like that? But was, was Enoch perfect? No. No. They all had sin about that. He's, Paul says, Look back through the Old Testament times and no one is righteous, no, not even one. There's not even one. Because you could take the greatest rabbi, the greatest imam, the greatest religious person, stack up all their religious works and when God looks at their religious works, he says, it doesn't mean anything to me. What matters is the work of my son. Isaiah says this, the prophet, chapter 64, verse six. He says, for all of us have become like one who was unclean and all of our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment and all of us are like, wither like a leaf and our iniquities, oh, they're like the wind, they take us away. Yeah, all of our works, he says, to God, our religious works are nothing more than a rag. A rag, a dirty old rag, why? Because he's only concerned with the work of Christ. Jesus talks about this in John 6, if you want to read it, where Jesus talks about, um, John 6, 20, 29, by the way, is the passage where Jesus says, uh, the only work that matters is that you believe in the Son. That's all God's looking for. He it doesn't care about your works. What's wrong with false religions? Here's, what, here's how they break down. Belief in God, whoever he or she may be, and you work your way to get in his presence. They're all like that. What is Christianity? Belief in God, who came to earth to die for us and rose again the third day, and it's his work that gives you his righteousness and that gets you into God's presence and his family. Totally different. Uh, for another doctoral class, I had to read uh, the, uh, all the Mormon writings this semester. So I wrote uh, the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price. So I, I spent some time reading, as you can see. <laughs> uh, and I was taking notes as I was reading, because I've studied it before. Because most of my friends in high school were all Mormons. So I have had many discussions. But I never sat and read all the writings through. So I did. So I took lots of notes as I read. And I kept finding the same concept when it came to salvation over and over and over again. Uh, I'll give you a case in point. Uh, Doctrine and Covenants, uh, chapter 5, verse 21. And now I command you, my servant Joseph, to repent and to walk more uprightly before me and to yield to the persuasions of men no more, and that you may be firm in, notice the participle here, in keeping the commandments wherewith I have commanded you, and notice the conditionality, and if you do this, behold, I grant unto you eternal life, and if you sh- even if you should be slain. He says, you want to get into heaven? Well, you got to obey the commandments that I told you. Do it perpetually. And if you do it perpetually enough, you get into heaven. Uh, that is not the only time they say that. They say that over and over again. Uh, chapter 9. Uh, chapter 9, verse 13. Uh, Doctrine of Covenants. Uh, do this thing which I have commanded you, and you shall prosper. Be faithful uh, and yield to no temptation. Stand fast. Stand fast. Perpetual. In the work wherewith I have called you, in, a hair of, in the hair on your head shall not be lost, and you shall be lifted up to the, on the last day. Notice, you have to stand fast constantly. You would never know if you stood fast enough, right? Because it would only take one sin to make you not stand fast. See? See, it's that work salvation. What does Paul say? There's no one who's righteous. No, not even one. Only one has ever been righteous. That's Christ. 
he fulfilled the law. He lived a perfect life. Those who know him know life. Those who don't know him don't know life. Paul ha- knew a lot about this, and so um, I introduced to you Paul's words about trying to get saved by your works. What does he say? Philippians 3, I close with this. He said, uh, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, like your works, religious works, I far more, which is our code word for, he's a poster child for trying to get into heaven based on your works. He says, I was circumcised the eighth day, check, of the nation of Israel, check, of the tribe of Benjamin, check, a Hebrew of Hebrews, check, as to the law, the Torah, I, I was a Pharisee, as to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church. Uh, As to the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless, he says, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, back then he says, those things I have done, what? I count them as a loss for the sake of Christ, the Messiah, he says. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ, Messiah, Jesus, my Lord, from whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Messiah, Christ and may be found in him, not having my own righteousness derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes by God, from God on the basis of what? Faith, not works. That I might know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. Paul said, I used to believe that all my religious stuff as a Jew would get me into God's presence, but then I ran into the risen Jew, Jesus. I changed my mindset completely and realized his work on the cross means everything. How do you think you're getting into heaven? Religious works? Uh, They don't get you there. Only the work of Christ gets you there. And you identify with his work by faith. And you might even be sitting here today going, I don't even believe in sin. Well, might God speak to your heart and show you the nature of sin? It's a very real thing in the world in which we live. Because only when you begin to understand your condition before God can you then see the light of the gospel to be saved. We have a lot of counselors after church who love to talk to you if you want to be saved. Today's the day. What a great day to do it. And if you're a believer, you should be motivated, uh, not just even this weekend, Memorial Day, but all days, to give people the bad news and the good news. What's the bad news? All are what? Under sin. What's the good news? Jesus is the one who delivers from sin. They need a savior. Let's pray. Father God, might we be faithful to deliver uh, the goods of the gospel, uh, to have the balance between the bad news and the good news uh, so that against the, the blackness of sin, they can see the diamonds of the glory of Christ and be saved. We pray for any in our church that don't know you. Might you draw them to yourself as you say in John 6 that you do. You call sinners toward yourself. And might they listen to your call as the good shepherd and come to you in faith give you this day trust that you would speak to us through this week so that our lives can reflect your life in Christ's name amen